Hello again. Um, this is a week where we have two relatively distinct topics. So I'm going to start, as I do with each topic, um, just with a fairly brief kind of overview uh, so that we've got some sense of where we're heading. So in this part of this week, we're talking about the duties to the court. And in particular, we're sort of breaking that down into three key themes. Our duties to the court generally, the duties that uh, lawyers or legal practitioners have to the administration of justice, and ultimately the duty to obey and uphold the law. Uh, most of the reading here, and there's a, as with most uh, areas that we cover, there's a reasonable amount of reading here. Um, uh, Del Pont chapters 17 to 19 are really key to what we're doing. But I think um, the case studies that are in literature and lamb, uh, sorry, Parker and Evans, getting my textbooks mixed up. The um, the case studies in particular in Parker and Evans, I think, are really useful. Um, so while Del Pont draws specifically on the cases, the authorities for the various propositions that we're dealing with over the next probably four videos in total, to hopefully quite short ones, um, I think the real world examples uh, and the way that um, Parker and Evans bring this to life for me has been really useful. So look, if you're choosing between reading and I get how busy this time of year is, especially with an assignment due very soon, um, for just getting through the topic in the week, Del Pond is your first point of call. Um, but really to be able to synthesize, to make sense of this stuff, I would definitely take the time to have a look at Parker and Evans as well. So by the time we get through this topic, you should be in a position to critically analyze the nature and the sources of the duties that lawyers have to the court. And again, that's why I think that being able to do that critical analysis relies on contextualizing. And I think Parker and Evans are particularly good for that. Um, you need to be able to interpret the content of the lawyer's duties to the court, identify potential areas for law reform, uh, something I'm not going to talk about a great deal as we move forward, but um, always it's a, that's a really great exam preparation tool in any subject really because almost all of the learning objectives for all of your law subjects are will in some way refer to, well, how should the law change? And if you've got that question ringing through your head as you're studying, you're going to be in a really good position to think critically. They kind of go together. So, you know, what doesn't make sense in this world um, now, particularly given the level of technology that we deal with, uh, you'll need to be able to apply various rules relating to lawyers' duties to the court in a range of contexts. Um, we'll do a lot of that over the next uh, few little videos and definitely in the tutes, I'm sure and identifying the source and the rush rationale for, in particular, advocates' immunity. Um, we're going to talk about that. Uh, but all of the different specific rules that bundle together in the lawyer's duty to the court and to the administration of justice. Now, I think what's really important here is to remember that uh, the duty to the law is one of the paramount duties. Um, the quote that I have on the slide here from Rondell, I hope I'm getting the emphasis on the right syllable, um, Rondell and Worsley, a 1969 UK case. Um, and the quote comes from Lord Reed. Um, so I'm going to turn sideways a little to look at it. For those of you looking on video, it's a bit weird. Every counsel has a duty to his client to fearlessly raise every issue, advance every argument and ask every question however distasteful, if they, I can't use that gendered language, if they think it will help their client's case. But as an officer of the court concerned in the administ uh, administration of justice, the advocate, they have an overriding duty to the court my emphasis here, an overriding duty to the court, to the standards of their profession and to the public, which may and often do lead to a conflict with the client's wishes or with what the client thinks are their best personal interests. Counsel must not lead the court. 
Defining the duty to the law isn't easy because there is a pervasive nature of the duty itself. There are a number of concepts about legal practice which inform or in turn are informed by this duty to the law, to obey the law, to put the needs of the court first. And these include duties to the public interest and the profession's independence um, and ultimately provide the limits to zealous representation of the client. Um, uh, the paramount duties um, are now articulated or codified in the solicitor's conduct rules and the QR code that is on the slide will take you directly to rules three and four. I think another thing that is well and truly worth reading as you think through this is former Supreme Court Justice Marilyn Warren's uh, speech, 2009 speech, uh, which is available on Canvas and um, I put a QR code there to make it very easy to find. Um, it's interesting, so the quote on the slide for those of you playing along in with earbuds on in the, um, in the, in, uh, in the podcast world, uh, is she says, when lawyers fail to ensure their duty to the course is at the forefront of their minds, they do a disservice to the client, to the profession and the public as a whole. That's a general hypothesis in her argument. The speech is really instructive because she works through some practical ramifications of that. And the question that's asked on Canvas is one that I think is really worth having in the back of your mind as you listen to these lectures that are coming up, as you attend the tutor and as ultimately you prepare for your assessment task for the exam. In the speech, Her Honour details the increasing number of lawyers working outside the courtroom and the increasing prevalence of conflicts seen by the courts. Why do you think this trend is occurring? Think about the interplay between the duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the duties to the court. Think about the nature of the way that the profession is changing, in particular the technology overlay. What does this mean? Um, I think that would stand you in very good stead. Um, have a look at the particular rules uh, in the um, Australian uh, solicitor's conduct rules, uh, so the uniform law equivalent essentially, um, to see what the special rules are for advocates. So the court has an inherent, or in the case of law, lower courts, I guess an implied jurisdiction over officers of the court and can restrain lawyers from acting if a fair-minded, reasonably informal person would find it to be subversive to the proper administration of justice. In other words, if there is a perception of a conflict or some kind of misleading of the court. Um, and in fact, misleading the court itself could even lead to a finding of contempt. Now, clearly uh, finding um, that... Uh, finding a subversion of justice or a contempt of court would be an extreme measure. And the courts only use it sparingly. But words or actions which interfere with the administration of justice or which disregard the court's authority can lead to severe consequences, including findings of contempt or a miscarriage of justice, a mistrial. And we'll look at a couple of examples of that. Um, on Canvas, you'll find there are a number of examples towards the end of this module of rules, really rules of etiquette. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about those, but um, you'll see that there are examples there where the actual conduct, the way that one speaks in court, can impact the ability of the court to hear the case. Um, in the 2003 Queensland Supreme Court of the Attorney General for Queensland and Lovett, um, a lawyer was overheard describing a magistrate um, by the press, in fact, um, essentially described the magistrate as a cretin. Um, and, and the results were as a subsequent uh, was a subsequent finding of contempt. So ignoring or arguing with or turning your back on the bench could be enough for a, um, an argument of contempt as well. So um, have a look on to, at Del Pont on this point as well, um, but be aware that there are special rules for advocates and in litigation. So coming back again, getting 
don't get stuck too much in the detail on this first video, Kath. Um, we're going to look at these duties to the court probably in a more traditional way. Um, and it's helpful or educative to keep in mind the idea that the duties go to the efficiency and expeditious conduct. So you have a duty not to waste the court's time. Uh, a duty of candour, we'll spend quite a bit of time on that, that duty of honesty and integrity, which go to the general duties. Uh, um, and we've talked about this idea of integrity over and over again um, over the last few weeks. Um, a duty not to interfere with the administration of justice and a duty not to abuse the process. Other academics, so for example, Bell and Abella, have approached uh, thinking about these duties in um, an alternative way. They've looked at thinking about candour in particular, integrity, and a duty ultimately to educate clients. So when they're talking about candour, they're talking about the duty to use legal processes in a way that is legal, honest, and respectful to the court and the tribunal. Um, the duty of integrity, on the other hand, is a duty to act with integrity and professionalism. And within that category are obligations to avoid what is charmingly referred to in the profession as sharp practice or to respect the court and to maintain civility in dealing with others. So captured up in that integrity is not just that kind of moral imperative, but duties to conduct yourself with a certain carriage. Um, with a certain level of politeness and formality. And then thirdly, a duty to educate the clients. Here what they're talking about is it's up to the lawyers to educate their client about the court processes with an aim of promoting public confidence in the administration of justice. Um, so in relation to thinking about um, the duty of education in particular, um, Graham Mew says that this requires a lawyer to educate clients about the court processes in the interest of promoting the public's confidence in the administration of justice. This requires us to educate clients about the limits of the law as well as about our professional obligations. We share responsibility for ensuring that broader society has a knowledge and an understanding of the law and appreciation of the values that are advanced by the rule of laws. <coughs> Oh, excuse me, too much talking already. So lawyers are really the problem solvers here. They're an important aspect of problem solving is actually interpreting the law for the clients, explaining the law in the way that means that they are able to make good choices in the way that they use the law to solve their problems. Um, uh, for a long time, I've had the view that my clients never really have a legal problem they have a problem that has a legal aspect to it. Uh, and really, the more holistically we can think about that and the more that we can help our clients separate out what are the legal issues and what are the commercial issues or the personal issues, the better off we are. Um, now, clearly, there are limitations to the law that will need to be respected. And these rely on lawyers remaining independent and exercising their professional judgment. Um, in fact, it's been pointed out that part of the duty to the court consists of informing the client that their duties are in fact paramount. So the duty to, that the lawyer has to the client is in fact paramount to the duties that they have to the client. The clients need to understand this. And so the educative role is really a means of addressing the conflict between the duty of the client and the duty to the law. So in the next video, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into this duty of court, um, and I'll see you then.